You may proceed. Mr. Uh, Chief Justice, uh, may it please the court. My name is uh, Jerry Ashford, and I represent Arthur Pearson, Sr. Uh, we are asking for a uh, peremptory order of reversal of the lower court decisions and reinstatement of the pastor's counterclaims, um, or at the very least, uh, a grant on his application for leave. In this court's um, opinion, Borkman uh, v. Baltimore, uh, the proper inquiry in this case is whether the church acted to exclude uh, the pastor. It is undisputed that the church did not act to exclude Pastor Pearson prior to the trustees taking adverse action against Pastor Pearson. In fact, in November 2011, one month before the trustees took action, the church chose to retain Pastor Pearson. And that's what this case is really all about, is choice, freedom of choice. Uh, which is guaranteed to the church, choice as to how to worship, who to select as their spiritual leader, and it's guaranteed by the, by the religion clauses of the First Amendment and the Michigan, Constitutional, Michi Michigan Constitution of Article 1, Section 4. This case is also about judicial protection and enforcement of that right. What good is a right that can't be enforced? Uh, and when a church makes a choice and who to select as its spiritual leader, and that choice is thwarted by a rogue group, then it's up to the courts to intervene. The question for us is how to enforce civil rights in the context of a religious organization. Uh, the, the establishment clause in the uh, federal constitution and our analog in ours uh, has been interpreted to uh, have the courts respect the religious polity by not intervening uh, to um, make determinations that are, are part of the religious uh, doctrine. This is a mixed case, is it not? I mean, there's, there's a contract, uh, and then there's this huge apparent schism in the church. Um, how, do we, how do we stick handle our way between that which is a um, legal and that which is religious here? Well, Justice Young, there's, there's no um, excessive entanglement in this case. We're just asking what for about a who, singular. Who a member is? Excuse me? Do we, do we have to decide who a member is in this case? Well, no, the members speaking? voted in November um, 2011, and they voted to retain this, this pastor. They never voted to um, discipline this pastor prior to the trustees acting. And it's undisputed that it, the, the constitutional authority in the church was the membership, the congregation. We can look at the pastor's contract yeah, we know who the using. Are. But you spoke earlier about a rogue congregation. So, no. you know, it seems that there's a split in the church between two different congregations. So, is this court supposed to decide who is the church? Which one of these churches is the church? Well, the church is the congregation voting. Right. Yeah, but and who the a church, member is is defined by your bylaws. Excuse me? Right? The, the, who is a member? Persons duly received by the members shall constitute the membership. That's what your bylaws say, right? That's, that's what the bylaws say, which were attached to Appellate's brief, yes. Okay. Do we, do we get to decide who, got to, who gets to vote? No. The, ju the, the members have already voted. The members but there wasn't voted. a dispute as to who was eligible to vote? No. 
Okay. There was no dispute at the time. In fact, both sides sat down and decided what the rules for this election would be. Both sides had monitors on both sides. And there that, was a second, oh, a second vote, correct? There was eight months later. At, at which time at, the pastor was discharged? After many members of the church had been purged from the membership roles. See, that's and that's the, in dispute. That's the thing that, that I think is, might be a problem. So are we supposed to decide whether those members were unlawfully <clears throat> purged such that they should have been included in the vote? But regardless, Justice Larson, we still have that, the, the pastor still would have damages for the intervening eight month period, at the very least. And so, so that's, that's why his counterclaims should survive. Because none of those counterclaims depend on the validity of that or invalidity of that second membership vote. That's correct. But that's only if you only seek damages up until the second vote. So is, is that, if you go beyond that, for the reasons that were just discussed, and it seems to me a whole lot of other reasons, um, you know, when you start talking about what, what damages were after that vote and you look into the le legitimacy of the vote, doesn't that require the court then to get involved in whether this was the right decision or not and whether this was the right pastor for this church or not in light of the allegations that were made and perhaps in light of the church's doctrine and so forth? Um, in other words, how, don't you have to cap your damages as of the June vote for there not to be excessive entanglement? Justice uh, Viviano, I, I have not really uh, gotten to the point where I've, I've calculated my damages uh, well, well, or, or researched that beyond the second election. I'm trying well, to Well, the second election, do you not concede if, if that's uh, done according to whatever the uh, church's rules are, right. that cuts off the pastor's damages. And, and, there's, and, and there's the rub. If it's done according to the rules of the church if it was legitimately done. That's the place I would where, agree. That, that's the place where the court can't get involved. In, in, in the, I, I think you, you have two different um, periods that you have to think about here. Because once, if you're asking the court to figure out who's a member, then you're running squarely into troubling First Amendment territory, right? I thought your application was, uh, was for money damages for the period where it's a strict contract-based claim, um, and that period before the second vote, um, your view was there is no question there that the court has to, there's no polity um, question that the court has to get involved in. So those counterclaims should survive. Am I misunderstanding your? No, I agree with that. Yes, no. I agree with that. I'm just, I just don't know if I'm ready to concede that, that there's no oh, okay. damages past the second election well, what, um, what at this time. What would be the basis for them then? What are my, what would past be, the second election? Past the second election. Um, I might say that the pastor mitigated his damages, but he was not um, recovering what he would have recovered had the entire church been able to vote. And okay, that, that's because no, that's, now they had the split of the congregation. That's, that's correct. All right, now you're asking me to figure out who should be in the congregation. I'm asking you to decide at that time if he was legitimately. No, uh, I'm sorry, sir. Justice Young, if, I'm, if, Just a minute. Okay. If you're asking us to determine the legitimacy of the second vote that expelled him, that requires necessarily we determine which part of the original congregation uh, should have been uh, considered members of the uh, church. Isn't that right? Well, I'm asking you to go back to the... Please, to the, just answer my question. I'm, well, I'm trying to do that. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm trying to say that there was a March 2012 election. That's, and that's the second election? That was the second election. Okay. March or June? March 2012, where the okay. board members, the trustees, ran uh, for office again. And there had already been a list posted on the church 
saying a lot of, uh, you know, purging the members of the church. Okay. And I'm saying that there may be a, there may be judicial review of those procedures and what occurred there without getting into polity or spiritual matters of the church. So, so how would I know whether members of your church were improperly expelled or not allowed to stand to run for trustee? How, what, what legal tools do I use to figure out that question? Well, I, I think we could look at um, whatever documents are available in the church. So like um, the church bylaws? Church bylaws or church agreements, any church agreements. Um, past and, practice. and past practices in the church. But is, is that something that a civil court should figure out? Isn't a civil court just supposed to defer to the church on that? Isn't that exactly the kind of thing where the civil court defers to the, to the church? Well, I understand that that practice is generally the court does defer to the to the um, church, but because where we can establishment clause, right? Yes, because church, we want churches to exercise their religion in their own way without interference from the government, right? Right. Okay. Right. But where we can look at documents and apply neutral principles without getting into religious issues then the court can make a, a, that kind of decision. It can provide judicial review. Do you want to reserve some time? Yes, no, I'll, reserve. No, I'll, I'll reserve the remainder. Okay. Good morning, my name is Bernard Schaefer. I represent Pilgrim Rest, uh, Brother Mayfield, and Brother Blackwell from the church. Uh, may it please the court, Mr. Chief Justice, this is a crime victim rights case. Defendant Pearson's status as a convicted felon is outcome determinative and must be so to avoid opening the floodgates to similar lawsuits. He was convicted of embezzling from his employer, Pilgrim Rest. Now after being fired, Defendant Pearson wants to sue the victims and the witnesses against him. The stipulation of fact for Defendant Pearson's no contest plea can be used against him to defend against his lawsuit pursuant to MRE 410. That fact stipulation requires that his counterclaim be dismissed. But this court must establish a rule. Criminal defendants may not lay in wait for their victims by pleading no contest to settle the criminal case and then turn around and sue their accusers. Here's an example of what would happen if the rule is not adopted. A teacher could sexually assault a student get fired, plead no contest, and then sue the school board for breach of contract and sue the victim and other witnesses for defamation, tortious interference with contract, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and civil conspiracy. Now perhaps this court is not prepared to adopt that rule. Still, summary disposition of defendant Pearson's counterclaim was warranted because he breached his duties as a corporate officer. The contract counterclaim should also be dismissed because defendant Pearson was the first breaching party, and that should result in the dismissal of the remaining counts as well. To the extent that there are First Amendment issues in this case, it's not an appropriate vehicle to consider them. This was not a case where a congregation decided to terminate the employment contract of an innocent pastor. Pilgrim Rest had good cause to terminate Counsel? defendant Pearson. Counsel, I, I really don't understand most of what you just said from a legal perspective. It is certainly the case that uh, someone who peculates, who steals in, uh, in this context, might not win the uh, case in, a, in, a, in this context where he's attempting to recover damages uh, that flow from the discovery of his theft. But I don't understand a, a rule that, that says that if he uh, is adjudicated guilty of the actual theft, he doesn't have the right, however improbably, to sue uh, the victim. I don't understand that legal concept. A teacher who, who is uh, convicted of sexually assaulting a student can sue everybody. It, there's no preclusion. It may be a stupid thing. It may be 
an unavailing event, but I don't know any law that precludes that. Do you? I'm arguing there should be a rule of law that does. Okay, maybe, like maybe a, perhaps, perhaps more to the point. I, I didn't understand that's why we were here. I thought I the trial hear. court said this is non-justiciable because of the First Amendment. So it's a, we, we can't get into it. We can't, we can't actually penetrate the defendant's counterclaims because of the First Amendment. And basically, you know, church is involved, so we can't get involved. And I thought the Court of Appeals, in a more robust way, upheld that. They said we, these claims are non-justiciable because they involve a church. And our question, I thought, to, to the parties was, is, is there anything about adjudicating the defendant's counterclaims that, 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 that we should be able, that a, a civil court should be able to look at? You know, so, so let me ask you, in, in the abstract, under your position, are there any contracts between ministerial employees and their religious institutions that are enforceable in civil courts? I thought that you were looking at that issue which is why I filed the supplemental brief to the reply. Yeah. And that concerns <clears throat> where a pastor has earned compensation, completed their duties, and is owed money, they should be able to collect what they're owed. That's what those cases that Mr. Ashford had cited held. And I went through every one of them to illustrate that. So. Well, so but that's answer my question. There's, if there's a, yeah. Is there any contract that you, between a, a ministerial employee and their religious institution that's ever enforceable in civil court, yes or no? I just said yes. 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 Okay, so in this case, why not? Well, because he breached his duties as a corporate officer. Okay, just a moment. He's the first okay. breaching party yeah. to the contract. So those are so then we should so then this case so that so then you're going to win at the next at C10. But this is a C8 case yeah. where the courts below have said we cannot adjudicate this at all because of the First Amendment. And you're saying, well, actually, maybe you can, we have but we're going to win down the line. And that you may well be right about. I mean, I, you you made a lot of good arguments about why this particular plaintiff defendant with a counterclaim, whatever you call it, may well lose. But that's not what the question we're asking today, right? Well, I'm presenting alternative grounds because the court in its order didn't indicate what question it was going to address today. It, we were simply indicated okay, there was so, going to be so the mini hearing. Let's say we're interested in the First Amendment question, in the okay. ministerial exception, ecclesiastical abstention, how, however we call it. Is it your position that on those grounds, ministerial exception, ecclesiastical abstention, the contract counterclaims are permissible? They should not be dismissed? There's no, no First Amendment bar to hearing those claims? No. Then I would con why, why, what is the scope of the bar and, and why, why does it apply here? Okay. <clears throat> the ministerial exception requires that all of Defendant Pearson's counterclaims be dismissed. Why? Why? The reason is because the U.S. Supreme Court has dictated that the civil courts must abstain from ministerial termination disputes. That was the holding in the Serbian Eastern Orthodox Church case upon when, which when that is, Hosanna when that, Tabor when that's was based. on religious grounds, when the congregation is making a determination on religious grounds, what you've articulated, if, if this were a dispute between the principal of an uh, independent school and the school, what you said is that there was an anticipatory breach of the contract by the principal that relieves the school of its obligations under the contract, correct? Yes. Now, if this were in the civil arena, as I said, principal and a school, that would be litigated. And so I'm trying to figure out why, because this, this contractual dispute occurs in the, in the context of an employment contract with a church and its minister, it suddenly loses its, uh, the, the courts lose their capacity to adjudicate that contractual dispute. I had thought that your argument in that respect, and correct me if I'm incorrect, was that there is entanglement with the church impossible violation of the First Amendment where in order for a church 
to replace Minister A with Minister B, it has to pay Minister A damages. And thus, in the course of paying Minister A damages, they are paying a financial cost in order to shift the leadership of their church from Minister A to Minister B. Is that an argument you're making? Is that an argument you have sympathy with? Is that an argument that's implicit in what you have raised here? No, if we're talking First Amendment, the ministerial exception, which grants to the church the unequivocal right to select its minister, means the civil courts cannot hear claims regarding breach of contract, regarding intentional interference with contract, and there's three when, other... When there's, no, when there's no religious doctrine involved. Uh, absolutely. It's because, just the fact that it's a church and a minister. Then why do you write a contract? If it's, if it has, if it's never enforceable in civil court at all, why, 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 why bother? Why not just say, we're not writing a contract that's worthless? Or do you write it just to make people feel better? Or what's the... Why do we do it? There's no reason to do it. Okay. There's no point in it. Because right. with regard to a church, it has an unequivocal right to select its minister so the so the so that whole contract charade was just to for what why why do we go through that that feels like a waste of time doesn't it well it unknowing people entered into contracts without realizing that they're not forcible okay that's that's the well the not every line. contract well, ends up in court either right so maybe a reason to write a contract is here it says the annual base salary of fifty thousand dollars shall be paid to the pastor and that gives your board of directors or board of trustees, whatever your governing body is called, some notice about how much they should pay him. So it helps your internal operating. It also would give the pastor a reason to go to the congregation and say, hey, you guys promised me and you're God's people. You live up to your word. You promised me you'd pay $50,000 and you only paid me 40. That could be a reason. It could be enforceable internally among your membership and i conceded there if you've earned the compensation that you've been promised you have a right to give it, well, get well, it. Well, but at the point right where the congregation the says we don't want you to be serving anymore you have to go no, but then you have minute. to go let me, let me ask this question because you just said something very interesting so what if you made a contract with the pastor you said his annual salary should be fifty thousand dollars and your church only paid him forty thousand dollars and then he says, hey, please, congregation, pay me the other $10,000. And the congregation says, no. Can he come to court to get the $10,000 difference? If he's fully earned that $10,000, yes. Who decides, so then the the, contract, who decides that? So you're saying that a judge or a jury should decide that question. It is enforceable in a civil court? Yes. Because it's just money damages and doesn't involve a decision of the polity to, it's not a decision about their Because it's earned money. Leader. So why and it's money damages if you're not paid what you've earned. So I thought the defendant here was alleging that he was just seeking money damages in his counterclaims. And that's why this was a contract that could be, or at least at this stage, at the CH stage, might be a contract that could be enforced in civil court. And it may well be that down the line during discovery, we find that to actually give him any relief on his counterclaims, we have to figure out who's a member. And that is impermissible for a court to do. And so your clients win down the line. But at the C8 stage, he's saying, I'm seeking for money damages, just like the $40,000, $50,000 difference. And so he gets to figure out if these are questions that a court can enforce. Is that, what's wrong with that, given what you just said to Justice Larson? Well, the issue is, <clears throat> are you seeking to get compensation you already earned, or are you seeking to get compensation you haven't earned? Exactly the question. That's what he says. Yeah. If it sounds like we all agree. The, the, the trustee board had statutory authority to suspend without pay on January 27, 2012. Where is that, where is that authority found? That's uh, 450.2535. And, and who's going to decide whether the authority was properly executed? You mean as a, as a the, in the co civil law? That's in the Michigan Nonprofit Corporation Act. I, I've cited that in every court. I understand that. We understand. That's a civil so court. So courts are going to decide this. Can you defend, given your admission, can you defend how the Court of Appeals dismissed this case on the ecclesiastical abstention doctrine? 
for the ministerial exception? At this phase, with because no <clears throat> Mr. Ashford did not make the point with the Court of Appeals that he made in his reply to the application here. He didn't make the point of you've got a line of cases that say you can get your earned compensation. He was just talking about those five, six it's counts. It's a C8 motion. I understand it's that. Not, we don't get so you're to saying he waived this argument now because he didn't make it to the Court of Appeals. Okay, it so was I'm never right. raised in the trial court or the Wait Court of Appeals. Wait a minute. Okay. What argument did he waive? The argument that you can make a claim for earned wages that you haven't been paid. That's what was made in the ah. uh, reply to my response to the application mm -hmm. for leave to appeal. Mm -hmm. That's when it first came up. Mm -hmm. So I had to brief it. But you don't have anything. He was paid your, all this pay. Your, your <coughs> argument is on the merits of the claim. Your argument is not that this court or any court can't hear a contract claim between a pastor and a church. Any kind of contract claim. My concession is that the court can hear a claim for back wages. Per contract, not per contract. I mean, well, really? If you what worked, about, like, if you showed up for 40 hours and you did the work that week, you get your paycheck, whether you're a minister or not. Well, not if your claim arises under Title VII. The U.S. Supreme Court has said you don't get that. But that's not, a, I think he's saying that it's not a discrimination claim. He's just saying a pure money damages claim. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. so you've used the phrase several times, whether you're a minister or not. I thought the whole purpose of looking at this case was to try to identify some of those areas, or at least a standard for determining the, distinct, the areas in which there's, in fact, a distinction between a minister and not being a minister. Where does it make a difference that one is a minister as opposed to a barber or a, a pharmacist? Is there not some realm within which the law is, in fact, applied differently, even though we're talking about so-called neutral laws as contract or property or corporate laws. Is there not a realm in which the Supreme Court and the Constitution command that even though in one realm something might seem to represent fair treatment and treatment according to a particular law, that there's something different about the impact of that law when the object is a minister or a church or some theological uh, dispute uh, within that church. Well, that bright line was established in Hosanna Tabor. There was a bright line in Hosanna where Tabor. Where the court, the U.S. Supreme Court, identified what the definition of a minister was and said there is a ministerial exception, and in the case of a Title VII case, we're going to hold today, you can't bring your lawsuit. And it said, but we're not deciding yet about other claims, but the courts of other states, as I've indicated, have looked at those other claims and found that the ministerial exception, Connecticut, Wisconsin, Washington, so I would ask this state to join those states and indicate that the ministerial exception prevents claims for uh, intentional affliction with contract, um, civil conspiracy, all. Mr. Pearson isn't just making a contract claim. So He's there's got no, those there's other no ecclesi tort claims. The, the ecclesiastical exemption is not implicated here. The nature by which the decision making within the church was undertaken, for example, that's not implicated here. It's only the Hosanna Tabor ministerial exemption that's narrowly implicated. Is that your view? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Council? Yes, I would like to address the uh, ministerial exception. Uh, the ministerial exception uh, was uh, decided in Hosanna Tabor uh, 2012 by U.S. Supreme Court. Supreme Court uh, limited uh, their, uh, the exception to uh, employment discrimination cases. And uh, the reasoning was that those laws are compulsory. Here we have a contract where we have parties who are voluntarily entering into an agreement. They are inviting judicial review. They are expecting 
judicial review if one side believes there is a breach. And that's the difference here. Um, as far as um, Wisconsin, the case uh, De Bruin, which is an interesting case. Um, in De Bruin, there's a, it, it's also a breach of contract case. And, but the, it's distinguished because Mr. Bruin is at, it's a, she's disputing um, the four cause clause in the contract. She was discharged for cause. And she's asking the court to second guess uh, the church. There's no dispute that the church acted in that case. There is in this case. And we are not asking you to second guess any decision of the church. Are you disputing whether your client was, would have been or was, was properly discharged for cause in light of the embezzlement um, charges that were brought against him as of 2012 when the remaining members voted him out of the pastor, pastor's office? No. But you, Just, are, you, but you are challenging the propriety of that vote. I am. The allocation of authority in the church, uh, the pay and benefits provisions of the contract, you can use neutral principles to review that contract. The contract, yes, but not whether the co congregation legitimately constituted, voted him out of office. That to me... For the second, for the second election you're yeah, referring to, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you don't think that would involve us trying to determine who is a legitimate member of this church? I think that if we went to the March election, we, the March 2012 election, there may be, uh, and, and, and reviewing the documents and the procedures of that election, there may be uh, judicial view, review may be permissible if we can find uh, non-religious grounds to base that review on. What is other than religion in a church? is the basis of membership. Well, you can't come to my church and be a member without being accepted by the church. But I'm sure that there may be some type of written uh, documentation uh, that may explain or the, that the church may enforce who's a member and who's not a member. That where we don't have to get into uh, relig religious principles. So I, just so I'm clear, I understand your position. You would stipulate then that if the members properly constituted voted, your client wouldn't challenge cause that he was discharged for cause. Not after not in the June 2012 election. I would agree with you. But I would like to say that but your argument is the procedures of that election. You contest those. Yes. That was a le that I was a legitimate vote of the congregation of the members. Yes. Yes. And I would like to say, leave the court with, uh, if the pastor had lost the November 2011 election, we wouldn't be here today. And if the pastor had lost the election and came back to the church and said, I'm not leaving, instead I'm going to pastor this church with my supporters, then they would be here, my opposing counsel would be here suing for breach of contract. Thank, Thank you. you. The case is submitted and the call is concluded.